Welcome to Get Your Spirit in Shape, United Methodist Communications and UMC.org's podcast to help us keep our souls as healthy as our bodies. I'm Joy Avino. When we put on our identity in Christ, when we lean in to the fact that God has called us beloved children, we're like unstoppable. Like we become these super people, not because like there's some kind of like extra chromosome of faith that we have, but rather we actually trust what God says about us. That's Rachel Billups, the lead pastor of Ginghamsburg United Methodist Church in Dayton, Ohio, and the author of Be Bold, Finding Your Fears. In our conversation, she reminds us to let go of the false stories that we've heard about ourselves and to live into our true identity as beloved children of God. Rachel Billups, welcome to Get Your Spirit in Shape. Well, hello and thank you, Joe. I'm so delighted to be here. You're the author of a recently released book titled Be Bold, Finding Your Fears. What do you mean by fierce? What does it mean to be fierce? It's so interesting to me, Joe, that a lot of people have asked that question because I think sometimes we as church folk believe that we're called to be meek. Scripture tells us, blessed are the meek. And so to hear that word, be bold or even fierce, it makes us a little anxious. But really, I think fierce is the opposite of fear. I see a lot of fear in the church and a lot of folks who, for whatever reason, are really held back by personal and public fears. And so this discovery of finding your fears is allowing the work of the Holy Spirit to work in you and through you and to let go of some of that fear that's holding you back and really to step into your fears. So that's what I mean by fears. And, and when did you first kind of discover this need to be more fierce and less fearful? When I was born. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really fascinating. I kind of grew up in an isolated place. I grew up in what we call a two-point charge, 50 people on a great Sunday. I grew up in the church. Um, certainly my parents weren't necessarily pastors. In fact, my dad really didn't even uh, go. Uh, church wasn't necessarily his priority as I was growing up. And what I found kind of growing up in a bit of isolation that I was pretty much afraid of everything. Afraid to drive too far away from home, afraid to be away from home, afraid to really step out into uh, the plans and the purposes that God had for my life. And so at a very young age, I was face to face with a whole lot of fear about a lot of things. But what, what really stunk in my life is that I also within felt this God call erupting to do things that I was terrified of doing, i.e. public speaking, right? I can remember being in, in high school and having to give a speech before the class, actually in a French class that I was in, and just being in tears, not able to, to speak or talk in front of the class and having a delightful French teacher, Miss Egbert, giving me the ability to wait until class was over and to do the speech just to her because I was just that petrified of public speaking. I think all of us have these fears, these inherent fears that say, I can't, I won't, I shouldn't, I'm not going to do it. And all of those fears really keep us from living the Jesus life that Jesus has called us to live. So you, you, you talk in the book about um, limitation prophecies. You kind of start there. These things that are spoken over us that, that hold us back. Can you say more about them? I believe all of us are face-to-face -face with what I call limitation prophecies. These kind of negative words that are spoken over us. Sometimes it's as simple as our family or our folk don't do that kind of thing. We don't get educated. We don't go to college. We don't uh, get that job. And frankly, families are really good at speaking limitation prophecies over us. In my book, you'll discover that I'm not just saying, hey, my grandma said this, my dad said this, but rather these limitations were spoken over them. And so generationally, sometimes we pass a a limitation prophecy from one generation to the next. And so I extend a, a quite a bit of grace uh, to my family because I realize like it's not their fault. It's just what they know and what they have known. But what's fascinating to me is even at an early age, I found Jesus and I discovered the Bible. And when I opened up the pages of the Bible, I heard stories about people like Deborah and David who even though they had all of these cultural and even family limitations, 
because they trusted in God, God was able to use them to do some pretty incredible stuff. And so even at a young age, I began to say, okay, God, I may not trust myself. I may not believe in me, but I believe in you and in your work in people's lives. And so I took some, some baby steps along the way to say, okay, I'm going to do the next right thing that God is calling me to do and, and would step out in faith and, uh, and then would either fail (laughs) or at the very least, um, would have some degree of like, oh, I can do this. I began uh, probably in high school to feel a call into pastoral ministry, preaching ministry. And I remember this tiny, wasn't even a United Methodist Church, but tiny Christ and Christian Union Church that asked me to come and, and speak at a youth event they were doing. And so I did, and I'd never preached before. I'm sure it was a terrible sermon, but there was something that I said or something about the testimony that I gave that these more seasoned, older folks came to me and said, Hey, God, God used you to speak to me tonight. And that's really all I needed. I didn't need like affirmation, like, Hey, you were good, but I needed to know that I was on the right God path, that God was using me, not because it was me, but, but rather because God was choosing me to really do this thing that I was terrified of doing. And so, you know, I would take one step and I would also, still to this day, I still use scripture to remind myself, you know, Rachel, you know that God's going to show up and you know that God's going to use you. Suck it up, buttercup. (laughs) God did not give you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power of love and a sound mind. Trust God, uh, even when you don't trust yourself. So is that that one of the tips that you would kind of give to those who are struggling with fear is to just uh, remember the promises of God and build those up in your heart? Absolutely. Have a a few go-to scriptures that really remind you of who you are and whose you are. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of times we, we focus on our own inability when we have an identity, we are beloved children of the living God. If we've said yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit is alive and at work in us. And I think so often we, even those of us who, who call ourselves Christians, even those of us who have said yes to Jesus We walk around as though we have no power, but I think it is claiming those promises, holding on to the power and operating out of the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That really is important. Well, one of the sections in the book that I was really drawn to was this um, illustration you use of the Wonder Woman costume when you were a child. Do you mind sharing that story? Sure. So uh, when I was a little girl, I I um, had one of these Wonder Woman costumes, and I was kind of like many kids in the '80s. Like I love that costume, and I just refused to really wear anything else. I'd put it on <laughs> over and over and over again to the point where my um, my mom would get so angry, and it was you know so dingy and dirty. She was just infuriated that that I uh, refused to wear anything else. But it's amazing to me that. When I put on that costume, I really felt like I had power, you know, Mm. and I think we see this in children. You know, I have four kids of my own and whether it's my five-year-old David who puts on a Batman mask or um, I have a two-year-old named Sarah who, when she puts on a Superman t-shirt or, you know, a Wonder Woman t-shirt herself, she is, she just has this fierce that just kind of bubbles out when we put on our identity in Christ. When we lean in to the fact that God has called us beloved children, we're like unstoppable. Like we become these super people, not because like there's some kind of like extra chromosome of faith that we have, but rather we actually trust what God says about us. But there are a lot of things in our lives in that particular uh, chapter in the book. Mm -hmm. I really talk about how we and others at five years old with that Wonder Woman costume on I thought I was unstoppable, but over the years, those limitation prophecies, those moments of bullying, uh, that chapter is rightfully t- uh, entitled Confessions of a Mean Girl. When I myself was, you know, in seventh grade, I, I just, uh, I tore someone up. You'll read mm-hmm. about it in the book mm-hmm. and really limited their person, their potential and their power with my words. And, and I think um, whether we like it or not, we in the community of faith can do the same. When we see people emerging, sometimes when we see the power of God at work in people's lives, we don't know what to do with it. And so sometimes we want to contain it or put it in a category. 
And we've got to be careful because we can speak a bullying word or a limitation prophecy over a brother or sister because we just kind of don't understand what's going on. So I think it's really important um, for us to recognize that, like, you know, we do have this kind of superpower within. It's called the Holy Spirit, right? Yeah. And uh, that we can operate out of that if, if we're willing to trust God. Hmm. Yeah, because I think a lot of us have those, or maybe it's just me, but we have I have those negative tapes in my head sometimes that that are always telling me I'm not enough, right? I'm not good enough, prepared enough, thin enough, good looking enough, whatever that is, whatever not enough. But you kind of remind us that Christ in us is enough. That's right. You know, I think it's um, it's the devil's greatest tool to get us to think that our identity is something other than in Jesus you know, that we are less than. Yeah. And you asked this great question too, is like, which story are you going to believe? God's story about who you are or what these other voices are telling you? People get stuck there quite a bit, I imagine. Well, I mean, frankly, Joe, we get stuck there every day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, it takes, I mean, think about it. You wake up one morning, uh, particularly as a pastor, I wake up one morning and I get an email or you know, a love letter on Facebook or something. And so, and people are being a little bit nasty and I have a choice to make. Either I can take all that personally, put it on myself, get angry, frustrated, all those kinds of things. Or I can take a deep breath Mm. and say, Hey, what's going on here? This person is a beloved child of God and they're hurting and they're frustrated. What's this really about? But if I don't take that moment to like declare my identity and that person's identity, And I'm typing some stuff that's less than Christ-like. Pretty <laughs> I mean, it's just true. It's yeah. just true. And so I think we're we're tempted. We're tempted to operate out of an identity that is not our own. Uh, it's rooted in fear. Mm-hmm. It really is. It's rooted in this fear that, like, I can't believe that this person is, you know, you fill in the blank. Right, right. And, and it's honest for me, when I hear those things, it's like, oh, they found me out. Right. That's, you know, I'm really not good enough. Well, and and I think you just hit something that I think is really, really important. You know, we believe in this. uh, We believe in grace and we believe in sanctifying grace. Mm -hmm. I think so often we have this expectation, like I said yes to Jesus. Therefore, there's this magic Holy Spirit wand and everything in my life is like perfect. And I've got to be perfect and I can't make mistakes and I can't be growing and I can't show that I'm growing. And certainly I'm going to put on the Jesus mask and just pretend that everything's okay. I actually think that's an absolute disservice to the entirety of the community of faith. Hmm. Um, You'll see in my book that I try to be um, as honest, not brutal, but as honest as I possibly can be because I think vulnerability and and authenticity and honesty are part of the sanctification process as part of me working toward perfection, because I'm not going to get there by like pretending that I'm something that I'm not. I'm a big old work in progress. Um, I'm a sinner saved by grace and I'm still working out some of the pretty ugly pieces of my soul. Um, because, uh, sometimes in my life, I continue to not believe the truth about what Jesus says about me. Mm. Um, and when I operate out of that untruth, when I operate out of the ugliness, man, uh, things can get, uh, they can get a little ugly. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but I like your thought too, about admitting that we're not there yet or being vulnerable and being open with the places in our life where we're not all that we could be is a way of leading on to that sanctification that it, it allows us to continue to grow when we can admit we're not there yet. Is that what you were saying? That's exactly right. And I think, Joe, sometimes where we get ourselves off track is we see those places of flaws or those places of like needed growth or those kind of messy places in our life. And we point to those and we say, see, that's my identity. Right. Oh, that's not your identity. Mm. You're a work in progress. Your identity, God's clear. You're beloved child of the living God, Mm -hmm. you know? And so when we, I think it's when... uh, you know, you were talking about that fear when someone points something out like, oh my gosh, uh, they're right. I'm a horrible human being. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. My motives were terrible. I, I, you know, I was just trying to be famous, not faithful, you know, all those kinds <laughs> of things. Like, um, honestly, I think it's that fear because we're like, ah, that, that, that's, that's kind of true, but it's only kind of true. Mm. It's only a half truth. It does. We begin to like uncover our motives and say, you know what? Um, there might be some pride in there or fear there, 
or a desire for manipulation in there or a desire to be um, affirmed in there. But recognizing the motives, I mean, that's what I love about our United Methodist faith. I mean, uh, John Wesley was really good at asking questions that weren't just about behaviors. Mm. They were about the motives behind the behaviors. Like, how is it with your soul really isn't like, what you doing today that it's going to get you in trouble? It's no, no, no. What's the thing behind the thing behind the thing? Mm. Because it's that that's killing you. Wow. Well said. I like that a lot. I could spend a lot of time here, but I want to, I want to kind of go on a little bit other directions and, and you touched on this a little bit. Let, let's talk about the vulnerability that you share in the book. Cause one of the things I think is wonderful about this book. Um, and we're talking about Rachel Billups new book, uh, be bold, finding your fears is that it's part Bible study, part kind of sermon esque, but there's another part of it. That's memoir. You, you tell a lot of stories about your life. In fact, um, every chapter, as I was kind of going over it, I noticed there was a Bible story and there was a Rachel story. Is that part of what it looks like to be fierce, to be able to be vulnerable and share these stories? Oh, absolutely. I think um, in my book, you're going to discover that I encourage uh, the listener, the reader, um, to really look at the good, the bad, and the in-between of your life and to not just throw it all away, because I think we're really good at that, <laughs> but to say, how can these moments in my life actually be the fuel for my fears? How can I take all of this and say, you know what? Um, it was useful. You know, some of the most trying moments of my life, frankly, some of my biggest failures have really helped me be a better preacher, be a better pastor, be a better mom, be a better spouse. Um, you know, like really have shaped my future in such a way that if I ignored them or stuffed them or pretended they didn't exist, I wouldn't be the person that I am today. Mm -hmm. And so I'm encouraging everybody to kind of, it is, this whole book writing process really was a spiritual experience for me. Um, that kind of faith memoir, if you will, how does my, how does the Bible and my own faith narrative and kind of the work of the Holy Spirit how do those three things combine to really help me understand how God has been present and at work in my life and how God is wanting me to continue to grow and to find those moments of fierce? Because, Joe, I'm in the thick of it right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's kind of ironic to me um, uh, about the time that this book came out. Um, uh, be bold, finding your fierce. Um, I have been recently named the new lead pastor at Ginghamsburg Church. And so it's been a little bit hilarious every time that I've been like, hey, this is hard. I'm not sure I want to do this. Someone sends me a quote from my book that has helped them <laughs> that happens to be exactly what I need for the day. And I think to myself, God, you're hilarious. You know, like, seriously. I always say it this way. Fear has a regular return policy. Um, and so, um, yeah, the, the book has really been an opportunity for me and for me, for me to find that in myself, but for me to also encourage other folk uh, to do that kind of spiritual evaluation of your life um, and to, to, to see how God has been so present in it all, the good, the bad, and the in-between. Would you recommend for people to kind of take the time to write down some of those, a spiritual autobiography, as some people have called it? Oh, absolutely. You know, um, it's at the end of each chapter of my book, I give people some questions to wrestle with. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, like every author has expectations, but I'd love for people to not only wrestle with those questions, but to send me stuff. Like I, I've already started hearing people's personal stories about um, how my book encouraged them in, in a particular area of their lives or even encouraged them to share their story uh, in a way that they've never felt the freedom to share it before. And I think that's good stuff. Was was any part of the book difficult to write? Any stories hard to share? You know, it's it's kind of interesting. I don't think that this is true of very many authors, but um, I kind of outlined uh, with the help of other persons, I outlined what ended up being like 20 possible chapters and then and then narrowed that down to 10 and then started writing. Um, on a timeline. And uh, I really did just wake up and say, I had certain days that I had planned on writing, okay, God, what are we doing here? <laughs> and I really felt led by the spirit to write chapter after chapter. And we kind of, I kind of went with Jesus on that. And I started with chapter eight, which is 
probably the most emotional and difficult chapter that I've ever written in my life, but frankly, my favorite chapter of the Oh, yeah, okay. And so uh, this is a story about uh, my uncle, Mick, and um, it's a story that, it's a family story that I've never, um, I've never shared in this kind of way, this honestly, publicly. Hmm. And uh, so I, I prepped my family uh, for this chapter as well, but uh, it was the most powerful chapter for me to write. Uh, some of the other chapters, like I get really gut honest about my marriage in chapter five, and I happened to write that one on my anniversary. <laughs> and uh, my mother-in-law was doing some editing ahead of time um, on some of these chapters. And I totally forgot to warn her because she doesn't know <laughs> that chapter. And, um, and so, but it was really cool because she was like, I didn't know this stuff, but mm. this is really, really powerful. And I'm so glad um, that you're sharing this with me and with the world. So, yeah. And some of the stuff was hard to write because some things that happen to you, um, you're not necessarily mad at the people that were part of that experience. And so you try your best to like share your story in a way that's authentic to you and um, doesn't, isn't mean to other people, frankly. One of the places of emphasis in the book is about how fierce is not a one-time decision, but it's something that we do. It's a bunch of little decisions. Uh, can you say more about that? Yeah. Um, I, I really believe like, uh, I, like I said earlier, like fear definitely has a regular return policy. And I, every single day when we wake up, we are, um, we are face to face with, and whether it's fear or just a feeling of being totally overwhelmed and not knowing the next decision that we need to make, um, I think we can, we can live our lives pretty scared and live a very, um, limited life. And so every day we have choices to make, am I going to be courageous or am I going to let fear win the day? You know? Mm -hmm. And so I think finding your fears, it's daily, it's weekly, it's monthly. <laughs> um, and I think, um, I think every year we look back and we say, wow, um, I've gotten better at this. You know, I've yeah. gotten better at this. Yeah. I imagine yeah. it gets easier, huh? It does get easier. Because you trust, <laughs> you trust God more often and right. say, ah, just get over yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about how the, our fears is intended to be lived out in community, right? This isn't a solo endeavor, but it's meant to benefit. Um, it's meant to be a gift. I think you say to the human community. Yeah. You know, I, and I also think a lot of times when we think about being bold and finding our fears, we have this kind of lone ranger picture in our mind. Like, it's all about me versus the world. Um, but we, as a Christian community, we have an identity in Christ that isn't just about me and Jesus. It's me and Jesus and everybody else. And so I think sometimes if we think that fierce is about me standing up against uh, other people in the community, you got the wrong deal. When, when we're living a fierce, courageous life, it, number one, encourages the people around us to live a fierce, courageous life, uh, too. But I also believe that it's past generation to generation. Like we should be teaching, encouraging, cultivating the courage and the fierceness and the boldness in our community of faith um, to the next generation. And when I say next generation, I'm not just talking about young people. I'm talking about no matter what age of a disciple you are, <laughs> uh, you should be stepping into uh, that God call, that God job, that, that God nudge uh, for the day. Uh, that God has for you. Frankly, I would never have found my fears if it wasn't for the community of faith who is giving me a space and place and language and all of that to really find it. So the last question that I ask every guest on Get Your Spirit in Shape is simply this, how do you keep your spirit in shape? You know, I have a kind of fun story about uh, one of the things that I do, because certainly there I have kind of multiple practices. I believe discipline breeds discipline. And so I have multiple practices in my life that really help keep me in shape, mind, body and spirit. I can go into that later. But one of the most profound practices for me, I actually have a 7 a.m. Facebook prayer time that I do every single day. Now, how I started doing this is last year uh, during Holy Week, um, I always have kind of used the Book of Common Prayer, or even uh, right now I've been using Common Prayer, a liturgy for ordinary radicals. And so I, 
I did that in my regular prayer time. And every once in a while, I pop that up on Facebook and people would be like, what are you using? You have prayer beads. What are those? All this kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so Holy Week of last year, I thought I'm going to do this this entire oh. week. Well, um, I started it. Um, and by day three, I was like, snap, this is really something people like <laughs> I had hundreds of people who were popping on there throughout the day, people who are with me every day. And so it's been over a year um, that I've been doing Facebook live prayer time every single day. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so, and I have people from all over the world. I have people throughout the country. Um, I have folks in, you know, we're a mega church and it makes a mega church feel a lot smaller uh, when your pastor's on prayer time every day praying for you and the many uh, concerns that you might have. And so what it's really done for me, Joe, is it's kept me very centered You know, like, so I start the day in a very centered place. And when you're centered, it's really tough to be grumbly, right? (laughs) (laughs) Like when you're centered, uh, you, I feel fueled for the day. And I really believe that God um, was urging me to, to start that practice, both as care for uh, the big church, because I feel like God knew that we were going to be going through some stuff, you know, and I've got folks all over the theological gamut who are popping onto my prayer time. Prayer is a unifying force, mm. you know? And so um, it's just been really life-giving to me. And yes, there are some mornings that I'm like, oh, snap, I have to get on prayer time because there are some little old ladies who are going to get on Facebook and say, Pastor Rachel, are you alive? Is everything okay <laughs> if I'm not on there in a timely manner? So that's been a, a really life-giving practice yeah. um, for me. Yeah, and and you just hinted at too that it's it's a discipline, right? It's it's something yeah. that you do even on the days when you may be less than excited to get it started. Yeah. What a wonderful conversation. I, I enjoyed your book and I've so loved this conversation um, that we've had together. Thank you so much for uh, for this time. Thank you. That was Rachel Billups, lead pastor of Ginghamsburg United Methodist Church in Dayton, Ohio. To learn more about Rachel and to order her book, Be Bold, Finding Your Fierce, go to umc.org slash podcasts and look for this conversation. Along with some helpful links about Rachel, there's a link to my email address for you to share your thoughts with me, a transcript of this talk, and a place to subscribe to our podcast and others you might find interesting. Thanks for listening. I'll be back soon with another conversation that will help us keep our souls as healthy as our bodies. I'm Joy Avino. Peace.